Thanks for coming. So if you take nothing else, you just need to read. Um, so I was talking to my daughter Jasmine about um, this talk beforehand. And so she nicely summarized everything I'm going to say in just a few lines. So you can all go home now. Just remember our star is not born like we are. It's born in a cloud in a galaxy. Gravity pushes in, makes a fireball. Gas is cold, so it squashes, and then it gets hot. And that's a star. All right, so you can all go home. We're done. So I want you to go home. Is this on? It doesn't feel very loud. Yeah, I want you to go home feeling like you've learned something today. So I want to give you a little, little taster. So hopefully you'll ride with me a little bit, but feel like you've taken something away, not just pretty pictures. I'll show lots of pretty pictures as well. Um, so we'll see how we go. So what do we even mean by a star being born? So, well, let's start with a quick quiz. Does anyone know what the nearest star is? I'm going to pick on somebody. Venus? Venus is not the nearest star. Anybody else? Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is not the nearest star. Well, let's go with the uh, respected ASV over here, I believe. Our own sun. Our own sun is the nearest star. All right, so that's really important. So let's start with that. So here's our nearest star. Many of you will have seen it, um, hopefully today. So the question we're trying to ask is, well, how did it get there? So how did it end up in the sky with us going around it? And how did other stars get there that we also see in the sky? Now, often we look with very powerful telescopes. And we see things like this. Does anyone know what that is? Oh, it's written there, so if you can read. Go and shout it out. Galaxy. A galaxy. Now, what are galaxies made of? Stars. Okay, so sometimes you won't notice it at first, but if you look at a picture like this, then all the little dots in here are suns, stars like the sun. So that every little dot in that picture is, is a star like the sun. Do anyone know how many stars there are in a galaxy like that? Have a guess. <laughs> well, no, no, no guesses from third year students. <laughs> We've got billions, so we'll get, let's get more precise than billions. So, uh, this, yeah, we're still on. Let's go with that. Hundreds of billions. Hundreds of billions. All right, so 100 billion is a pretty good number. That's about, um, well, we don't count them all, but we can work out how much the galaxy weighs, essentially. So we can work out, we know the average mass of a star is about half the mass of the sun. So you can know how much the galaxy weighs, and that sort of tells you how many stars are in it. You can also see how bright it is. But you may have seen lots of galaxies like this before, but I want you to look at them with new eyes tonight. So change your eyes. And think about something you probably haven't seen by looking at lots of pictures of this type of galaxy. And it's really obvious once I've told you a lot of things. OK, so we'll, we'll try and tell you a lot of things, but you'll see what's quite odd and but very striking about all galaxies like these. OK, so let's start with another question, just to get you on the internet. How are stars like cats? They give up heat. Oh, hang on. Here we go. We're rocketing. I was going to say they give off heat. They give off heat. All right. So there's a cat giving off heat. And there's a star giving off heat. It's going to be a bit weird using two microphones. So does anyone know what more specifically is the same about a cat and a star? Oh, hang on. We've got a clever audience tonight. Black body radiation. Black body radiation. Does anyone know what that is? So it's the kind of, well, it's what kind of heat, but what do we mean by heat? We really mean colour. So I can tell how hot that cat is by its colour. Not because it's like grey and fluffy, but because it's glowing. The cat is glowing. So anyone tell me, like, in this room, what else might be glowing like that? All right, us. Okay, so we also shine, but we're quite cold. Okay, so if you look at... So I'm, I don't look like I'm shining now, but, well, if I had the right kind of eyes, I would see all of you guys shining. And does anyone know what wavelength you shine in? 
So you're shining the light that you can't see. So you see infrared. So you need infrared goggles to see you guys shining. But the special thing is that because I can see you shining in the infrared, if I had infrared goggles, which I don't, I can tell something about you which is very important. All right, someone said, maybe a little bit louder. Temperature. So I can tell your temperature by looking at you and seeing how you're glowing. And so that's a, a special property of everything that is basically complicated. So everything that's sort of complicated enough to the, you know, the heat can kind of bounce around a lot, like us, like cats, like stars, they all show the same kind of spectrum. It's called a black body spectrum, and it was discovered by Planck um, a long time ago now, over 100 years ago. And so the nice thing about that is that, that when you look at stars in the sky, you can tell their temperature by by their colour and more, more precisely the spectrum. Okay, so very roughly, you can look at the stars and you can tell their temperature by what colour they are. All right, so you can look at all those stars in the sky and you can see, well, some are kind of you know, yellowy and some are kind of bluey. And you can see what temperature they are by their colour. Okay, so the answer is that both emit a black body spectrum and that means that you can tell the temperature by roughly looking at the colour. Okay, so in other words, you shine like a star. They're all stars here. But you shine basically exactly the same way that a star does. And I can tell your temperature because you shine in the infrared. So when I look at a star and see whether it's blue or yellow or red, I can basically tell how hot it is. So, well, you can look at this one and you can see, so, this, so a spectrum really means how bright it is as a function of colour, so as a function of wavelength. And so for the sun, you s what colour is the sun? Come on, someone who's seen the sun? All right, so if we're giving this talk in England, then no one would be able to answer that question. But we're not. So there's the sun. It's kind of yellowy-orange, and that tells you the sun's temperature. So the sun is about 5,700 degrees Celsius. Uh, 5,700 degrees Kelvin, which is about 5,000... It's a bit off, but... <laughs> roughly 5,000, let's... 5 to 6,000 degrees on the surface, because the surface is what you see. So not on the inside, but on the surface. Okay, so what is the difference between these two galaxies? Go on. That's a pretty good answer. I don't know if you heard that answer. Must have been a good answer, it's my son. Go on. They're both made of different stars. They're both made of different stars. What kind of stars are in that galaxy? Different galaxies. Don't know. What sort of stars are in the galaxy on the left and what sort of stars are in the galaxy on the right? I heard someone say. Um, on the one on the left there's newer stars and on the one on the right there's older. Ooh, newer stars. I don't know anything about new and old just yet. <laughs> I know. What do you mean by newer and old? Red giants and the ones here in view have... Oh, okay. So we're jumping ahead way too fast. But the ones on the right are red and kind of old. And the ones on the left are blue. Okay, so blue means hotter or colder. Hotter or cold. Hotter. It's like warmer, warmer. Okay, so how hot are these stars? Well, the answer is about, oh, so I can tell by looking at them, they're blue. That means they're about 40,000 degrees compared to the sun, which at the surface is about 5,000 degrees. Okay, so this tells you something very important about the stars. Okay, so how long can a star like that shine for? How would we work it out? I'll give you a clue. So if I have a light bulb and a battery, how long can I... It's not going to work because it's a dead light bulb. Because it's not energy saving, so that's why it was in my dead light bulbs pile. How long can a battery power a light bulb for? Switch it off. What's well, <laughs> you switch it off is, a, yeah, is a one answer. What if I never switched it off? Until the, the battery goes flat. So basically a star will shine for as long until the battery goes flat. Okay, so we can work out exactly how long you can shine a star for by working out what the battery is 
and how long, well, how long it shines for. So it's exactly like if you're driving in your car and you've got some petrol in, how long is it going to take before you run out of petrol? It's the same question. So, you, you know, if you drive a car, you know you've got 45 litres in the tank, you know you've got a car that uses, you know, 20 litres per 100 kilometres. You can tell, well, either how far or how long it's going to take you before you run out of petrol. Okay, so you do the same thing with stars, so same thing with the light bulb. So there's an energy saving light bulb and a battery. You work out how many hours it would take to run out of fuel. What about you guys? How long would it take, how long can you shine for? You shine like stars? All right, so you can do the same calculation. Let's do it more specifically. So what are you powered by? Right, so let's go with pizza. So there's a Super Supreme. It's got 6,654 kilojoules in it. So if you ate a Super Supreme pizza, how long can you stay warm for? Right, so apparently according to the website 8700.com.au, the average person needs about, or uses up about 8,700 kilojoules per day. So say I ate two pizzas, two Super Supremes, one for breakfast, one for dinner. How long would it be before I started getting cold again? Yeah, so about a day and a half. All right, so that's the, that's the calculation we're going to do for a star, is how much energy is in it and how much does it use. Okay, so that's a pretty good analogy because uh, how, do you, how do you make energy from pizza? You eat it, right? So stars kind of eat as well. So that's, a, that's not a bad analogy. The other one is that, well, it's a bit harder to think of yourself as shining because we shine in the infrared. But if you think about light bulbs, that's a bit more like a star. So, well, on the top of this light bulb, it tells me how bright it should be if it was working. I wonder if you can read. Uh, 40. 40 watts. So if I know my light bulb is 40 watts, and I know my battery has, well, watts is, you know, know what watts is in units of energy per time? So it's joules per second. So if I know how many joules are in my battery, I know how many joules per second my light bulb will use, I can work out how many seconds I'm going to have in the start. So we need to work out how bright the sun is. So my light bulb is 40 watts. How bright is the sun? the microphone. Let's have a guess. In watts. What? 1,000? 1, 1,000. Let's go bigger than 1,000. Someone said 2 million. Let's go bigger than 2 million. Uh, 10 to the power of 26. Oh, cheating third years again. Yep, so 10 to the power of 26. Do you know how you would write 10 to the power of 26? So that's a four, it's actually four, it starts with a four, just like 40. And then you write 26 zeros, and that's how many, that's how bright the sun is in watts. Yes, yeah, so it's a big number, which is why we don't write it out like that. So we use, we write it down by just how many zeros after the four. We don't need to be too precise about it, but so the sun shines with four, with 26 zeros after it watts. Okay, what about how much energy is in the sun? What does the sun eat? Right, so the sun eats hydrogen. What does it do with it? Well, just a while, what do you do with your pizza? Chew it. You chew it, and what does it turn into? Well, let's not get too detailed here. <laughs> so you chew it, it turns into energy. Well, sort of. The energy comes out as a byproduct of turning your pizza into something else. Kids, what do you turn your pizza into? Shout it out. Right. Right, poo. <laughs> All right, so the, you turn the pizza into waste, in other words, poo. So the stars do something similar. What do they eat? They eat hydrogen. This is from a website called imboard.com. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's a star, any star. It eats hydrogen and it spits out helium. Well, it doesn't spit it out, it turns it into helium inside itself. Okay, now, the trick is that when you've turned hydrogen into helium, you get some energy out.
How long? So we've got 10 of the 44 joules. How bright is the sun in watts? Four times 10 to the 26. So divide one by the other, and it tells you how many seconds the, su the sun can shine for. Just like if you divide you know, number of joules in a battery or the number of joules in a pizza divided by 8,700 kilojoules per day, exactly the same thing. Okay, so if anyone can do it in their head, 10 to the 44 divided by 4 by 10 to the 26 gives you about 3 by 10 to the 17 seconds. And that tells you the sun can shine for, well, so it's about pi by 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. We've got lights, we've got action. So the sun can shine for about 10 billion years, which is good because we're still here. It's still there. So we know the Earth is about 5 billion years old, so the sun's about halfway done, right, which is good. We've only got 5 billion years left, so get all your talks in while you can. Yep, we're on. Yep. All right, good. So we can just whip through that. Stars eat themselves. They convert some of their mass into energy, 0.7% times the usable mass of the sun that could be converted into helium. And that tells you the energy in the sun is 10 to the 44 joules. Okay? So there's 10 to the 37 pizzas in the sun. All right, so how long can the sun shine? We just did the calculation roughly. The answer is about 10 billion years. Okay, but the whole point of the story is not about the sun. It's about these stars. Now, these stars are a lot hotter than the sun. And they're a lot brighter than the sun. But they also have more mass. Okay, so we want to do the same calculation, but for these stars. And then you'll never look at a galaxy the same way again. Okay, so let's do the same calculation for these stars. So a blue star is about 10 times the mass of the sun. So if you think about the, the mass being like the battery, it's like it's got 10 batteries worth of energy, or 10 more, 10 to the 38 pizzas worth. All right, so we've got 10 batteries on top instead of just one. And how much brighter is a blue star than the sun? Well, it's, we know it's eight times hotter by looking at the color. And it turns out the luminosity goes like the temperature to the fourth power. So the temperature, so if it's eight times hotter, it's 4,000 times brighter. Now, something that's 4,000 times brighter, that's like going from a, an LED light bulb to one of those, you know, road lamp things that you use uh, on building sites to like light up airports and things. Right, so in a blue star is like 10 more batteries, but going from a little one watt LED to a, you know, four kilowatt um, big lamp thing. Right, so how much shorter will a, will a blue star live for than the sun? 10 times more fuel, but 4,000 times faster to burn it. Right, so it's 400 times shorter than the sun. Now, can anyone figure out in their head what 400 times shorter than 10 billion is in years? Well, it gets to 25, and it's 25 million. Okay, now, an astronomy talk is the only time that you'll ever hear it said that 25 million, you'll all agree, is a really short time. Okay, but it is. Why is 25 million a really short time? Okay, so it's like, it's like the real film stars. Blue stars are like the, you know, the real film stars of the galaxy. They live fast and then they die young. Does anyone know how they die as well? It's, hopefully film stars don't die this way. So they explode all over the place. Okay, so they will finish and explode. I don't know any film stars that explode. I don't know, know any human babies that explode after a little while as well. But they're really, they live violently and quick and they die really fast in 25 million years. Why is 25 million years a short time? All right, so I'll start with a quiz again. All right, start with an easy one. How long does it take the Earth to go around? Roughly a day. <laughs> Roughly a day. Roughly a day, we're not very confident. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty easy. So it takes the Earth a day to spin around. What does the Earth go around? The sun. 
How long does it take the Earth to go around the sun? Roughly a year. Yep. And how long, but so this is things that everyone knows, right? But everybody should know this. How long does it take the sun to go around the galaxy? 250,000 years. We're off by a couple of the magnitude. About 250 million years is a good answer. Right, so it takes the sun about 230 million years to go around the galaxy. Okay, so this is like another year. We should, everyone should know this. It's like, how long is a year? You know, it's like how long, you know, how many times have we been around the galaxy? Right, so, but go back to the original question, which is why is 25 million years a short time? So you think about that galaxy turning around, spinning, takes the sun 230 million years to go around. So think about those blue stars that you've seen in those galaxies. There's another random spiral galaxy. So what does it imply about the blue stars? Right, so they'll get a tenth, let's say they're a bit louder. They'll get a tenth of the way around before they're gone. Right, so they're dead before they go around. So they'll get about a tenth of the way around, and then they run out of fuel. They're going to explode. So we see galaxies full of blue stars. Where do they come from? So they have to be made there. And you can see it even more obviously. So these are galaxies you've probably seen lots of times, but you should never look at them the same way again. Because you see blue stars concentrated along these spiral arms. When you think about 25 million years and the really bright ones are dead. And you can see just as you pass out of the spiral arms, there's no more blue stars. So they're born in the spiral arms, and they travel a little way out, and then they die. Yeah? And what do you end up with after they're all dead? Sorry? Asteroids? Not asteroids. Well, the sun's not dead. How long does the sun live for? 10 billion years. So not all stars do this. It's only the bright ones. Yep, so the normal stars like the sun, the kind of yellowy orange ones, about one times the mass of the sun, they're going to live for a long time. 10 billion years, that's like nearly the age of the universe. Yeah, so they're going to keep shining essentially forever. Okay, but the blue stars are the, they're the bright, hot ones that are going to die quickly. Okay, and the implication is that they're born, they must be being born in the spiral arms. Okay, so what can they be being born from? They're certainly born from hydrogen. But what else is in those kind of galaxies? Apart from just stars. Dust. dust. Someone said dust. So stars are not made of dust. Hydrogen. hydrogen. Yes, there's definitely hydrogen, but let's be a bit more general. Gas. All right. So there's gas. So what are stars made from? Gas. So there's gas there. So there's material there to make stars. Yep. Yeah? So it must be the stars are being made from the gas that we see in the galaxy. When the galaxy runs out of gas, it's going to stop making stars. Got it? All right, so you're never going to look at a galaxy the same way again. But every spiral galaxy you see, they're full of blue stars. Okay, but their star, the whole galaxy is a star factory. But what we'd really, really like to do is zoom inside one of those galaxies and look up close at like, where the stars are being born. But they're too far away, so we can't do it. What about our own galaxy? What sort of galaxy is ours? It's a spiral. Yeah, and we live inside it. Tick. And we can look up close at the places in our galaxy, we're close to a spiral arm, at where stars should be being made. If so, our own galaxy is exactly like this. Okay, we don't know exactly what our galaxy looks like. 
But you can see basically these, you can see these star factories in other galaxies by, um, so you can see the big dusty lanes and you see these big red blobby things and they're very cold and dusty places. And they're basically the places where, well, we think, well, we know that stars are being made in these other galaxies. And we want to see it, if we want to see the process happening, we have to look inside, from the inside at one of these clouds. Okay, so what does the Milky Way look like? Well, the short answer is we don't really know, but we can have a guess. That's what the Milky Way looks like. Yeah. All right, so there's a, a pretty reasonable guess. Um, the answer is, so M83 is a pretty good approximation if you want to think what the Milky Way might look like as a real galaxy rather than the artist's impression. You can see it looks pretty close to M83 there. Um, we actually did some work on this just this year about what the galaxy looks like. That's our best impression of what we think the galaxy looks like. But basically that plot on the right is what you actually see when you try and map the galaxy. And so we were trying to match that plot with, you know, some just simulating the motion of the gas through the galaxy. And you can see, well, we end up with something which is actually not far away from the, the kind of previous ideas either. It's got a little bar, it's got a few spiral arms, and you are, well, here you can see in the top plot. Okay, so we're close to one of the spiral arms, and if we look up in the sky, we should be able to see the galaxy kind of side on. Okay, so our galaxy doesn't look like that because we see it side on. So here's a little movie of the calculation we did. But so essentially, you know, you've got to think of us being right inside the the galactic plane. So that's what we see when we look up at the night sky. Okay, now when you look up at the night sky, on a really dark night somewhere a long way from here, such as Lockhart Gorge, this is one of the most beautiful pictures of um, the galaxy rising by um, a Melbourne astrophotographer, Alex Cherney. I'm sure many of you in the SV would know. He takes these wonderful time lapses of the Milky Way rising above um, you know, above the horizon. Now, what's weird about looking at a galaxy full of stars in the sky? It's hard to see from the city, but if you've ever been in the country, it's, you know, it's pretty obvious. What do you see? A dust. Got. Do you see a galaxy full of stars? Bright, white stars. Sort of. But what's, what's like missing from the middle of it? I'll give you a clue. So here's a sample of something I got from under my bed. What is it? Dust. It's dust. And what is dust very good at doing? Blocking, blocking light. So what you see is a whole lot of really dusty clouds blocking the light from the stars. Okay, and those dusty clouds, the clouds are about 1% dust, but dust, you only, you only let a little dust a little bit of dust and you can't see through it. You pass that around if you like. So. Okay, and, and so those are the clouds where, those are the star factories of the Milky Way. And you can see the close ones because basically the ones that are really close to us appear out of the plane of the galaxy. So the closer they get to us, you, can, you know, the ones that are far away, they're definitely in the galaxy, but the ones that are really nearby, they sort of stretch out of the plane. So if you look at some of these, I don't know if we've got a pointer here. This looks like a pointy thing. Maybe, maybe not. Um, well, so you can see you can see a thing called the Pipe Nebula. It's upside down in the southern hemisphere. Let's take a look at another one. So one of the most famous nearby star factories, you can see it's a sort of dark river, it's called. It's, it's Ophiuchus. Just above the Pipe Nebula, you can see these two kind of streaks going up. So that's, that's what's called, what we call a molecular cloud. Thanks. All right, so there it is. So you can see there's the Pipe Nebula. That's a cloud that's not forming any stars except for a few little things up the top there. But this is one of the ones we love to study, this Ophiuchus. It's a big funny shaped cloud. It has about 5,000 times the mass of the sun worth of gas in it. It's making stars. So stars are being made in um, all of these, basically all of these dusty regions are places where stars are being made. Okay, and it turns out the nearby ones are all in a sort of a nearby belt. So you can see this Ophiuchus is called the Gould Belt. But we love to study these ones that are really close to us. There's one called Taurus. So some of you might know the one called Orion. And we love to take pictures of these. Right? So most of the star formation nearby in the galaxy occurs in what's called the Gould Belt. And it's a belt of nearby star-forming clouds. 
All right, so, so this is what we do. We take maps of them and we can, we can actually count all the individual newborn stars in the cloud. All right, so there's a map of the Taurus molecular cloud. It's quite boring. Basically, it's dust against the background of stars. But, and here are all the little stars. Here are all the babies. How do we know that we're ba they're babies? Well, you'll see in a minute. So here's Ophiuchus. This is what's called an extinction map. So it's basically how much starlight has been blocked by the dust, which tells you sort of how dense the gas is. But this is what it looks like on the night sky. And again, all the dots are the newborn stars, and they're coloured there by various stages of how new they are. So what we want to do is, these are the clouds, you know, we can see, we can count all the stars being born in these little clouds, and we want to try and make models of how the process works. Okay? Now they start to get, as soon as you get some more massive stars, so just like the, the sun burns for 10 billion years and it's quite boring, as soon as you make a, a big star, it sort of changes everything. So as you get further away, so something like Orion starts to look a lot more spectacular. It's a little bit further away. So Orion, you'll know, is the saucepan. If you're from the ASV, this is all... I may even have it the wrong way around. I think it's all right. With well, Southern Hemisphere, anyway. So Orion, for example, in the infrared, looks like that. So it's like a cauldron of activity of, of stars being born. And the great nebula in Orion is this part down here in the belt. Or um, if you're in Aboriginal um, constellations, Orion is three brothers in a canoe, and the belt is a little fish uh, off to the side. So the Orion Nebula, that's what it looks like with the Hubble Space Telescope. When we're doing star formation, we look with infrared telescopes because you can see all the newborn stars. So they're blocked by dust here, but you can see with an infrared telescope just like I can see you guys glowing if I had an infrared goggles, I can look through the dust, like, just like I can sort of see through your clothes if I had infrared goggles. Sorry, that's a bit weird. And you can see all the newborn stars inside the Orion Nebula. So, it's, um, so it gets even more spectacular kind of the further you go in the galaxy, but they're also harder to study. So I'm giving distances here in parsecs, I'm sorry, but um, a parsec is, is three light years, roughly. So astronomers don't use light years, so I prefer not to use them to teach you bad habits. We use parsecs. It's a sort of meaningless distance, but it's not a meaningless distance. It's about the distance between stars. But it's about 8,000 parsecs to the middle of the galaxy. Does that help? No. no. Didn't think so. But the Carina Nebula is much further away, but it's, it's got the most massive star we know of in the Milky Way. And the Carina Nebula is doing all sorts of violent things. It's got bubbles. Carina, Eta Carina is is the nearest thing we've got to a star that's going to go supernovae because it's one of these young stars that's just burning through everything and it's going to explode. Yes, yeah, so it's one of those, it's even hotter than those blue stars. It's, well, so we've got Alex Hager here, he's an expert on supernovae. I believe he's given one of these talks before. But that's his speciality, what they do when they go bang. So now I just worry about them being born. All right, so what's special about molecular clouds? Why can you make stars in them? What's, what's good about them that enables them to make stars? Any suggestions? So somebody said they're dense. That's a very good answer. So they're dense. They're very dense. How dense? So if we say the density of water is about one gram per centimeter cubed, how dense do you think a molecular cloud is? So it's a hundredth maybe. So, well, first of all, there's lots of gas and dust. That's the raw material for making stars. About 1,000 to 1 million times the mass of the sun in one of these typical local clouds. So that's enough to make lots of stars. They're very dense. So very dense, we mean 0 0.000000000000 lot grams per centimeter squared, or 10 to the minus 21 grams per centimeter squared, or 10 to the minus 20, thereabouts. So that's really dense for the galaxy. Yeah, but it actually is the densest gas we can see in the galaxy. So it actually is pretty dense. It's the densest patches of gas, but it's purer than the purest vacuum you'd ever have on Earth. So it's dense for the galaxy, but let's get things in perspective. What else? There's something really important that you need to be able to form stars. So it's dense is good, that's one thing. There's something even more important than being dense. 
You need gravity, so gravity's always there wherever we are in the universe, that's for sure. We'll come on to that in a minute. What else you got to be? Not just dense. Oh, yeah. oh, we got about five there. Someone who said... Cold. Someone said cold. cold. Say it a bit louder. Cold. 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 How cold? Very cold. Very cold. How cold's very cold? Well, how cold can cold get? Do you know how cold cold can get? Into an ice cube. So you can get... Into an ice cube. So we're colder than ice cubes. Way colder than ice cubes. So someone said, how cold can cold get? So the coldest cold you can ever have is minus 273 degrees Celsius. That's called absolute zero. That's when everything stops moving. So you can't get colder than that because it means nothing's moving. So you can't have even define temperature properly. Okay, so molecular clouds are about 10 degrees above absolute zero. So they're minus 263 degrees Celsius. So why is cold good for making stars? Well, so molecules jiggling about is why they're cold. So molecules love to jiggle, and that means if you try and make them hot, they go, whoa, and they'll like release all their radiation and make it cold again. So that's why they're cold, is because they have molecules. Because molecules like hydrogen, the, the molecule, are really good coolant. But why is being cold good for making stars? So someone said gravity. Right, so they're very squishy. Okay, so, well, something about the temperature. So the temperature also tells you the speed of sound. We'll come back to that. It's about 200 meters a second. Somebody once asked me, but I thought there was no sound in space. Well, it's not true. You just need a really big ear. Okay, and they contain molecules, which is sort of what makes them cold. And they have these clusters of newborn stars in them. So wh how do we know they're newborn stars? Well, we can look deep inside and we can see what the stars look like. So here's a zoom in of Orion with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see baby stars. There they are. But they've still got their, di their disks of gas around them. So they've got swirling disks of gas around them. And they're still like all embedded in dust. Just like, you know, it's just like real babies. There's some baby stars still in the nursery. There's some human babies still in their nursery. Okay, and there's other, there's other signs that you see babies. Right, so just like human babies sometimes have disks around them. Sorry. <laughs> then baby stars have these disks of gas around them, and that's the place where planets are made. So the reason they get these disks is because any material that's sort of rotating a little bit can't land on the star. So it makes this swirling disk of stuff, and it slowly eats its way onto the star. And during that slow process, which takes about 10 million years, that's the time you've got for making planets. And we know there's lots of dust, and we, well, it goes something between having lots of dust and having planets. We can see sort of both ends, but what happens in the middle, there's a lot of arguments about. All right? And, well, often you, more often than not, you just can't see the really newborn stars at all. Because almost like they're still in the womb. So, something like this, you can see the Eagle Nebula. It's one of the most famous um, Hubble pictures. But basically, you can't see the newborn stars because they're still covered in dust. And why do you know they're newborn when they're covered in dust? Because as soon as they turn on, so dust melts really easily. I'd melt it if I still had it. But so dust is really fragile. And as soon as the star turns on, it gets rid of dust pretty quickly. Okay, so these stars must still be pretty cold. And they haven't quite contracted. And they probably haven't kicked, started fusing hydrogen yet. And so you know they're newborn because they're still in their dust. And they haven't... Um, lost it. Now the other thing you see is just like you see from human babies, you see outflows. So you see gas and stuff coming out. Now, well, can anyone tell me, sorry this is bad taste, but you see these really straight, um, you know, bits of gas shooting out from them. And so why do human babies have outflows? Someone said? Full. They're full. full. So they eat too much. And basically, they get full and they burp. Yeah, and they sort of, well, have an outflow, like the baby you see here. And basically, it's the same thing going on with stars. They're trying to eat lots of gas too quickly, 
And they come from these disks around the stars. As you can see, the jet's coming out from the middle of the disks. And, but basically, they're eating too much gas, and they can't swallow it all. And so some of it goes, bloop. Yeah? And stars only eat gas like that when they're still in their parental cloud. So, so that's a sign that you always see in these newborn, in these star-forming clouds, that you see these little blurps of gas as well. It's the same reason that human babies do it. Sorry for the picture. I had to work hard to find that. All right, so let's, let's try and cover some, um, some little bits of physics. How are stars made? Dust. So they're made of gas and dust. But what brings the gas and dust together to make a star? All right, so tell me one thing you know about gravity. This is a difficult quiz question. We'll ask someone difficult. So what does gravity start with? Mm. I'm after the letter. G. 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 Right, so the one thing we know about gravity is G. Okay, and that tells us actually nearly all we need to know. So if you want to learn something else, oh, so there's gravity. So stars are made at Hollywood, as we all know. So gravity is entirely encapsulated by the letter G. What do we mean by G? Gravity. Newton's constant. So that tells us how strong gravity is. So is gravity very strong? No, because that's 6 by 10 to the minus 11. So it's 10 zeros and a 6. So gravity is really weak. So if we want to say, well, what we want to ask is how long does it take gravity if I have something that's sort of this big and with this much mass in it, how long does it take gravity to kind of do that? Well, it might be a long time, but I want to know how long exactly. Because that's going to tell us how long it takes a molecular cloud to make stars. And it's all in that number. So basically all I need to do, and if you're taking a second year exam, this is all you'll need to do in a few weeks' time, is rearrange that equation to get a time. So we've got taking notes here. Yeah. Well, so you notice the little bits off the end that sometimes we ignore. But gravity has units. So it's 6.673 by 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed kilograms per second squared. So all I need to do is, so it's called dimensional analysis when you just jiggle it around to get a time. So you wanted something in the units of time. So we're going to take the second square on the, on the left and put the g on the right. And then we get a time if we know how much mass there is and how big it is. It's going to tell us how long gravity takes to do its thing. Okay, so that's the same. So second is like a time. Kilogram is like a mass. And uh, meters is like a length. So you jiggle them around and you get a time. So if you do any maths or you know how to jiggle things around, you'll, you can sort of make sense of that. If not, don't worry about it. Okay, but there's a time goes like the square root of the length cubed over g, the gravitational constant, times a mass. Right, and this really works well. So let's do an example. Well, it's a bit hard to do in your head, but if you're a little mathematical, go home and do an example. So take the length of like, you know, the Earth going around the sun. That's 1 AU. Take the mass of the sun. And that time scale, it tells you about a year. Well, roughly. It tells you about 60 days, which is pretty much a year. Yeah? Well, actually it is. The only factor missing is a factor of 2 pi, which is a factor of 6, which gets you to 360. Yeah? So actually, it's pretty good. It tells you pretty much how long it takes gravity to do things. So if you're a 1 AU from a mass of one solar mass, yeah, then it tells you that you know, things are going to happen in about a year. Okay, so another way of writing it is it's like 1 over the g times the density. So the only thing that gravity cares about is how dense something is. So if you know how dense it is, it tells you how long it's going to take to squish. If, if there's nothing else happening except gravity pulling, it tells you how long it takes to be squished. So what's the density of a molecular cloud? So it's about 10 to the minus 20 grams per centimeter squared. Okay, so all you need to do is put that number in there, and it tells you that the time for gravity to take something that's 10 to the minus 20 and pull it to zero 
is about a million years. All right, so we know basically how long star formation takes. We spent half a lecture on this in a second. Now we've done it in five minutes. Yeah? Now, the other thing that's really important, so basically gravity takes something big. This is a pretty good approximation from molecular cloud. It's sort of um, a bit messy and sort of turbulent, and gravity kind of squishes it. Now, what happens if I try and squish it too much? Why can't I squish it anymore? Why is it stopped? Right, there's something resisting gravity. So what resists gravity? Clue. Right, so pressure resists gravity. So pressure is the thing that resists gravity. So pressure, um, so basically hot things have more pressure, cold things have less pressure. So why can molecular clouds form stars? Because they're cold. So they don't have any pressure, so gravity pulls and nothing resists. In fact, they basically stay the same temperature as gravity pulls. They stay, the molecules keep jiggling and they stay 10 Kelvin. So they stay really cold. So gravity pulls it in, but there's no pressure that can resist the gravitational pull. And so it gets squashed and, and squashed and squashed until you get really tiny things and finally pressure can do something. Yep, so it can do something on really tiny things called In 146 seconds. Let's try this again. So you know, you know the time scale for pressure resist gravity because you know it from, well, I'll do it, the non-picture version, from something kind of familiar. What's that? Right, so lightning and thunder, you work out the time for pressure to support something by how long it takes the thunder to get you, right? You know how long sound waves travel in air, so you count th every three seconds as a kilometre. All right, we must be back. All right, we're on. All right, so the time for pressure to do its thing. 
It's about that. Okay? So basically, the time for pressure to do its thing is much longer than the time it takes gravity to do its thing. So gravity wins. Gravity can work faster until you get really small. Okay, so when you get really small, you can finally resist pressure. So star formation is essentially competition between gravity and pressure, where gravity wins on the large scales, but eventually you get small enough that pressure can win. And that's when you make a star. So that's enough talking about it. What we really need to do is, this is a